Hello, and welcome to the 18th episode of our Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe Talks. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and there is no chapter to be discussed this episode. As you will probably have noticed if you've been reading the book, uh, there are only 17 chapters in the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, though there are 17 chapters with quite a lot of stuff in them. Um, so this 18th episode is really just for me to look back uh, on what has come up over the last 17 episodes. What surprised me, um, to read out a few of your comments, which have been really interesting, give me lots to think about, um, and reflect on how, how the book might look slightly different to me now than it did when I started this process. So, I think it's been worthwhile uh, reading it chapter by chapter. Uh, I, hope, I hope you feel that too. Um, it's required a kind of attention uh, and a kind of scrutiny that can sometimes feel a bit mechanical and forced. Um, the old Cambridge practice of practical criticism of, of getting a text that you don't know anything about and sort of putting it under the microscope and being able to uh, deal with all its convolutions and complexities like that springs to mind. Um, it might strike you as a bit of a sort of tour de force to say, oh, I'm going to dedicate an entire episode uh, to each chapter. And it potentially did to me at the beginning. But I think, uh, certainly to me at least, the last 17 episodes have proved that there's an awful lot of stuff to get out of this text. And that taking it chapter by chapter allowed um, a level of scrutiny, of, of noticing interconnections, of noticing allusions elsewhere, that I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. In fact, one of the um, the first comments uh, on the series came from J.A. Renton, uh, who said, uh, when I read these as a child and reread as an adult, I just got swept into the story. I tend to view a book in my mind rather like a film, and this close reading has opened my eyes to so many things I missed. And I think that the same thing has happened for me that it's sometimes useful to divorce the chapters from their development of the plot, or indeed from our experience of consuming them as what next, and then, and what next, ooh, and what's going to happen there, um, because it shows a sort of richness and, and complexity that we might otherwise miss. So to other comments then, uh, Elizabeth Rambo put a really interesting comment here. Another mid-century literary pan encounter is Elizabeth Googe's Pilgrim's Inn, a.k.a. The Herb of Grace, the youngest child... The youngest children find a person with pipes at the centre of a wood who also draws animals there. It's in the Wind of the Willows illusion, but it also fits with the idea of a meeting with Pan as an early spiritual stage. That's absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you for that. It, it, it is astonishing how much Pan there is around. I mean, <laughs> one perhaps shouldn't be surprised, having read Ronald Hutton's work on um, paganism and the sort of the English literary imagination. Um, but the, the, the novels this time are absolutely soaked with it. Um, and so that, that's a, a fascinating example. Thank you. I must chase it up. I must chase it up because I've been meaning to read Elizabeth Googe for ages now. Um, people say very good things about her, um, so I must read her work. Thank you. Um, Brent Cutts says that the positive and negative meals is a helpful insight. And yeah, that's something that's really struck me. Again, it, it felt possibly a bit schematic to say, aha, here is <laughs> a meeting with someone from Narnia where they have food. Here is another meeting. You know, here's the um, the eating with Mr. Tumnus, here's the sort of perversion of a meal with the White Witch, here's the homely feast with the beavers, here's the high feast of Care Paravel. But that, I think, points out a strand of, of imagery that I wouldn't otherwise have noticed necessarily in these stories. Um, the, the insistence upon good and bad ways of feasting, we might say, good, bad ways of eating and gathering around food. Um, and I don't mean that simply in a, in a sort of health conscious way. I think, perhaps it shouldn't be surprising, but I think there is a, a Eucharistic thread of imagery working its way through this novel, particularly perhaps uh, in the ways in which we see muted examples of good eating and then this, this high feast at the end where a lot of glorious imagery seems to come together in Care Paravel. Um, so yeah, that, that was really interesting. Thanks for pointing that out, Brent. Um, Richard writes, Thanks so much for these. I'm reading Surprised by Joy at the moment. Lewis is quite critical about daydreaming as distinct from use of the imagination proper. Quotes, In my daydreams, I was training myself to be a fool. In mapping and chronicling animal land, I was training myself to be a novelist. End quote. I wonder if this also sheds some light on Edmund's royal fantasies. Walking through a land that ought to tantalise the imagination, he merely daydreams about mundane things and high street pleasures. Um, brilliant phrase, high street pleasures. I think that's absolutely right, yes. Uh, the, the imagination is, <coughs> pardon me, a subject that a lot of people have become very interested in um, around Lewis and, and his circle. If memory serves, there is a collected uh, book of essays called 
Faith and Imagination, C.S. Lewis and Friends, I think I'm getting that right, um, which deals with this question of the, not of the mythopoeic imagination, but the, um, the spiritual imagination and the poetic imagination. It draws in people like uh, Dorothy Sayers, and Charles Williams, um, and even Austin Farrer to talk about these questions. So, yeah, I think absolutely the people's imaginative reactions to Narnia, even within the text, are, I think, an index of not only whether they're good or bad, but the ways in which they might go to the good or go to the bad, as it were. Um, I think a lot of things that, things that happen around Edmund are, are terribly significant as both sort of warning us, but also showing how these things are, are understandable. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and yeah, the, the, the question of how one's imagination reacts. If memory serves, I, I think Lewis went into this in greater detail in an experiment in criticism. I seem to recall um, that he talks about different kinds of imaginary life, um, the, the mapping of uh, a river that rises in its sort of springs and then goes through all sorts of landscape and ends up at the sea, uh, versus um, imagining oneself in conversations or imagining other people uh, and their actions, or a kind of imagination where, if again, I'm, I'm quoting, I've, I've read the book in about 10 years, but um, that one is, one is always the hero, one always makes the, the funniest quips uh, and defeats the enemies and, and gets the beautiful women. Um, and that imagination can be both uh, vital and essential, but also it can limit us, perhaps paradoxically. Our very imaginations can prevent us from expanding uh, and seeing the sort of the wider horizon. So, you know, even the, the kind of escapism that that keeps us from developing you might link that to Chesterton's uh, discussion at the beginning of orthodoxy about the idea of um, thoughts that go around in a circle and can't ever spread out. And he said that's, that's the, the mark of someone who is trapped by um, uh, a mind which can't expand, which can't take account of reality. It, it's simply trapped in a sort of mental spiral. Um, so, yeah, really good point there from Richard. Thank you. Um, Penelope Wallace has, has written some fascinating stuff. Uh, I mentioned in an earlier episode that she gave other examples of Pan. Pan everywhere! I got, you know, appropriately given his name, perhaps. Um, the appearances in Chesterton and Sayers, which really made me think and perhaps retool some of my ideas about um, what Pan is doing in this novel. She also mentions that she, when uh, the children react to Aslan's name and they have all these uh, strange feelings like it's the beginning of the holidays or um, there's a lovely bit of music that's wafted past or Edmund feels this sort of horror and Peter feels suddenly brave and uh, and valiant. Um, she said that she'd linked that, if you remember, I, I linked that to the At the Name of Jesus passage uh, in Paul's letters. She said she'd always linked that to um, the idea of yearning and remembering that comes in uh, Lewis's work. Um, the idea of the, the sort of the numinous, the the apparently irrational, but that is that is calling to you from somewhere else. Um, I wonder whether we could, we could perhaps connect that to the image of Susan's horn that, that takes place uh, later on in the um, in the sequence of novels. So yeah, that's that's, that's immensely important in um, uh, in Lewis's thought. If if memory serves, uh, and I keep saying if memory serves because I'm uh, <laughs> I haven't got my references or my books on my table. I wonder what that might be. Uh, but if memory serves, uh, Serena Higgins um, has given a paper in the last couple of years about this very question. The the um, uh, the numinous, the uh, the unnameable almost. Um, in uh, Lewis's work. I must look that paper up again, actually, and read it. Um, she also says that uh, Peter's kingship and his sort of taking, I don't know, ownership of the dysfunction within the family reminded her of Caspian's claim that he's unready to be king and Aslan saying, that's the very reason you are ready. If you felt readier, you'd be less ready. Um, I don't think there's a, a pun on, on Ethelred going on there. <laughs> Ethelred Unrad, uh, Ethelred the Unready. But yeah, that there's a... It's one of the things that actually did did sort of surprise me um, going through these chapters is how much about kingship there is, how much this is a novel about rulership and the the correct kingship and bad kingship and you know a mirror for magistrates and all that sort of stuff I've been talking about. Um, Peter is perhaps a less important character than I remember him. Edmund's very much the main character of this novel, and I hadn't perhaps remembered that. But Peter's um, refractions of kingship and his growing towards kingship and rulership are, are interesting. Again, that's certainly tapping into the uh, the um, Hebrew scriptures concern with kingship and whether the people should have a king and what a king is and you know why a king stands before um, God and, and what what relationship uh, he has to his people. But possibly also to the, the political context of the time. This is a time when people are, are writing books and indeed waging wars about what kind of rulership we should have. You know, we're seeing the the great totalitarian movement of the 20th century and the horrors they caused. Um, 
uh, around this novel. So I wonder whether this, this concern with, with rulership and with the operations of the community uh, comes out particularly there. Um, here's a really interesting one again from, from Penelope Weiss. I was reminded of another enormously significant handshake in classic children's literature, Captain Flint apologising to John for calling him a liar in Swallows and Amazons. At least I think they shake hands, haven't got the book to hand. I can certainly empathise there. I don't know. This sounds really interesting. I'm afraid I haven't read Swallows and Amazons. This is a real gap in my education, particularly if I want to be talking about children's literature in this period. Um, that sounds great. It, it sounds absolutely right. And one of the things that, that has come out, actually, is just how much this is a novel of its time. Um, we often say that in quite a negative way about books and say, oh, well, it's a, it's a book of its time. You have to forgive <clears throat> that bit. And <clears throat> actually, they've, they've changed it in the new edition. It's great. It says a totally different word. Um, or, or, well, you have to understand that back then that was considered five degrees more progressive than most people thought about marriage. So, so really, he's the equivalent of the people who are five degrees more progressive than our current laws. Uh, yeah, that's good. Think about that. Um, I don't mean that in a, in a forgiving way. Um, but that this is a novel which I'd often thought as essentially largely in dialogue with the Bible and in dialogue with the, the small and thin stream of um, fantasy from the late 19th century. So um, things like uh, Lindsay um, and uh, George MacDonald. What I hadn't necessarily thought of it as a novel of its time in dialogue with the other children's literature of the period. And that's really struck me, things like you know, The Borrowers, The Wolves of Willoughby Chase, um, Lucy M. Boston's books, um, Philippa Pierce a bit later. Um, this, I hadn't instinctively thought of this as a, as a children's book sharing the, the cultural concerns of children's books at the time. And as well as Pan, children's books are mad on time in this period. You know, time slips, um, when time does and doesn't function. Not necessarily time travel, but, but rather like the wardrobe going in and out of times um, and discovering things in gardens and... and uh, all that sort of slightly gothic stuff that we talked about when we looked at its connections to uh, The Secret Garden. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a really interesting connection. I must follow that up. And she says here, Susan's pretty understandable question about working against the Emperor's magic always reminds me of St Peter's Heaven Forbid and the response, get thee behind me, Satan. Absolutely. Yes, there's a... Um, I mean, I, I linked it to a, um, another, uh, another a line about uh, not a, a jot or tittle passing from the law before it was fulfilled and I came not to... Uh, to destroy the law but to fulfill it um but yeah i think that really builds the sense that we are we are moving eastward moving towards jerusalem in that section of the novel and we're moving towards the passion and of course susan susan doesn't know what's going on um but has a has an understandable well this sounds terrible we should stop it which i think really underlines as i said at the time the anti-decetic strain in that part of the novel um rather like john barton's uh is it no love like this or Love Unknown, possibly from my song, is, is Love Unknown. Um, again, a, a book I don't happen to have on my desk or within reach at the moment. Um, he's very concerned with the tendency to play down the tragedy and to play down the, um, not necessarily the physical suffering, but the, the unnecessary quality in, in human terms, if not in the economy of salvation, the um, contingent aspects of the passion. But this isn't an orderly plot working out all fine. This should make us outraged. This should make us furious. You know, this, this should show us injustice that we don't see uh, too much, uh, sorry, we, we too often do not see in the world. Um, that by talking about the passion as an ordered and systematic thing working its way through to a, a logical conclusion, um, we lose something of both the meaning of the passion narrative and what it should do to us sort of in terms of moral outrage and, and in terms of um, how what, what response it should call forth from us. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a really good example. Um, I've noted down a few things here that, that surprised me, and I've, I've mentioned a few of them already, but things that have bubbled up through the process of taking it chapter by chapter and saying, ah, oh, here, and what's that, and what might this mean? Um, one is the internal structure of the book. It's a lot tighter than I had remembered. Um, that's, you know, arguably that's an effective criticism by, by saying I'm going to find something to say about in each chapter and I'm going to look for connections. You know, you could be accused of finding connections where there weren't any. But things, just small things like the, the reversal of colours between the White Witch and Father Christmas or the chain of meals, um, the, uh, the way in which this is sort of Aslan arrival story, rather like... Um, John's Gospel has been has been described as a, a passion narrative with an introduction tagged on. Um, the the shape of the novel is much tighter than I remembered. There is there is less wandering in and out of Narnia and having little adventures. As soon as they're in there, 
and as soon as Lucy comes out and then they all go in there, and I think that's part of the same plot, um, we're driving towards um, this, this great culminating event, uh, perhaps symbolised by the fact that the characters are always travelling. I hadn't noticed that. They're always, they're always fleeing or running or, or moving from one side of the fall of Baruna to another or going there or going here. Perhaps that's picking up on the Bunyan influence, um, on the, the, the general discussion of uh, sort of Christian life as a pilgrimage, uh, a journey. I think possibly that was less stressed in the writing of this period. I, I certainly get an impression from my reading that from the 80s and 90s onwards, it's been more of a cliche, dare I say it, to talk about life, uh, particularly the spiritual life, as a, as a journey and a path. Though, of course, it goes all the way back to the, the language of the way. Uh, in the New Testament, and indeed the, the language of you know setting, setting my feet upon the way and not stepping out of thy way um, in the Hebrew Scriptures. And but yeah, the the book is a lot tighter than I recalled. It's also bound up more with Lewis's other work. And again, I can be accused of seeing things that aren't there, or or perhaps adding stuff that I know Lewis also thought. But um, Michael Ward's great book on the seven heavens uh, in Narnia really opened my eyes to the way in which Lewis's thought is across his fiction and his apologetics and his scholarship is even if not all of a piece certainly strongly in dialogue with each other so he he um I think it's Michael Ward who who says that if you want to really understand the fiction you have to read the Oxford History of English Literature uh, volume English Literature in the 16th Century Blackett's Excluding Drama um the completion of the Clark Lectures Trinity College Cambridge 1944 CS Lewis I happen to have that one on my desk as you can hear <laughs> because Lewis thought you know talked of it as his major work uh, in the period that it was where he was putting all his ideas it was what he was most proud of uh, and and Michael Ward makes some astonishing readings of, of the fiction which you know I won't spoil although I've clearly drawn on them um, in these episodes go and read that book it's cracking I think they made a TV series of it um not many literary books of literary criticism you can say that about but yeah so so how a passage of Narnia, when I was trying to think what, you know, what might be the, the way he's thinking here, I was forced to go to the discarded image or I was forced to go to um, his, his comments on William Dunbar's poetry or um, the Screwtape Letters, <coughs> pardon me, um, or his essay on Bunyan, um, that Lewis's mind is, is doing the same sort of things or bringing the material together in his fiction that we can see elsewhere, which is not to say, I think, that he's a you know, a monotone or a, a one-note writer. Um, actually, one of, the, one of the joys of doing this has been to discover that the Narnia books are not just mere Christianity written out with people with, you know, fuzzy ears. This is not the Furries version uh, of, of uh, Lewis's uh, apologetic talks. There's a richness of complexity here that I think we often don't get in some of his more um, polemical uh, and, and explicit writings. Um, but certainly that, that, that you have to move across his both his, his plane of, of thought and the things that we know he read and was influenced by to understand it. And that's been great fun. Uh, along with that, I've been surprised just how many biblical uh, and patristic connections there are, but also how much they're reworked. I know I've said in, in episodes, oh, you know, what I find is interesting is this, but things like um, the Isaac imagery around um, Iman Edmund and how that points to the fact that Aslan's death physically looks more like Isaac's near sacrifice than it does Christ on the cross. Um, or, <coughs> pardon me, um, the, the at the name of Jesus stuff, or the, the travelling east. Um, it, it really focused, brought into focus for me, A, the fact that this is a, a Christian novel in, in more ways than one. It, it is not simply retelling a simple story. Um, it is a novel which has some sort of Narnian spirituality, and I'll be very careful about this because I'm not crazy about the idea um, that you know, we can use fictional texts, particularly uh, popular culture texts, and live our lives through them. Um, but I think they can enormously contribute to our spiritual lives. By Narnian spirituality, I mean that, that within the book, there are ways the world works, there are ways people interact with the world and with each other that have something to say about the Christian life. And also it's a Christian novel in the sense that if you sat down to write, to, to retell the story of Jesus in space or underwater or between talking fish or something, you'd be faced by a question of what do I mean with the story of Jesus? What, what do I think the story of Jesus is? And I think some of the most simplistic and dismissive readings of, of um, Narnia, perhaps both on the, on the enthusiastic side and on the, the critical side, assume there is such a thing as the story of Jesus that we all know. And if, you know, you, you, can, you can do this with it, you can do that with it, you know, you, you can make it about a fairy line or whatever. 
Um, but we all know it is, so it's actually, you know, it's not, it's quite straightforward. This has really persuaded me that it isn't, <laughs> that it was quite a task to, to write this. Um, and that perhaps he didn't do it consciously, but that his imagination has drawn together all sorts of symbols and reshaped them, reworked them. Um, as, I, as I've said, it, it's it's a, a story in which some of the episodes from the Gospels are combined or moved to different locations or the same thing happens, but different characters are involved, recognisably characters from other parts of the Gospels, or meanings from it, meanings of events are imputed from the epistles and that's made clear in the plot. The plotting shows a meaning which is actually made, only made explicit in the Bible elsewhere. Um, so yeah, that's that's. I was expecting the sort of the the added bits um, from the gospel to be bits from his literary influences or bits from the fantasy tradition. Often the things that are added uh, at the most crucial moments are added from elsewhere in in the Bible or elsewhere in Christian tradition. And along with that goes this uh, this thing I've been stressing about how deep his uh, reading the Christian tradition goes, how delightful it is to be looking at the imagery of the castle and think, hang on, this is, this is both Bunyan, but it's also Dunbar. Um, or to look up Adam Lee Bounden, um, and I, I sing a maid that is Macaless, and say, oh, this is a bit like this, and go, oh, hang on, 4,000 winter, no, it, and the apple, no, it really is very much like this. <laughs> that he's, um, he feels like a writer who's not separate from that tradition, and I'm, I'm perhaps straying into the territory of, of um, one of his lectures where he says, I'm the last of the dinosaurs, look, look well upon me, um, I'm the last man who will be full of all this stuff. Um, so perhaps I'm playing into his personal myth a bit there. Um, but no, I, I, that was really struck me about the book. Um, and, and the last thing, I've, I mentioned children's literature here, but I've talked about that a bit. And the last thing I've, I've put here is paganism. Um, fascinating, a, a, you know, a novel of its time in that sense as well, that it is animated by uh, the, the uh, imagination of its time that was deeply influenced by people like J.G. Fraser um, and uh, the the... the, the the sort of neo-pagan poets uh, of that period, Swinburne and that, and is also sort of pushing back against them, is is excited and animated by this idea of the enchanted Britain, the sort of thing you find in Kipling, perhaps, um, but is reformulating that to give an account of it in Christian terms, and specifically in, in Lewis's uh, view of, of the Christian faith. The, the moving parts of this uh, novel seem to be often enmeshed with that, what the novel's doing, not simply telling a story, as I've said, that we already know, but is gathering up material and then making something out of it. And um, there's more making in this book than I'd remembered. Um, and that, that perhaps is a, a useful note to end on. It, <laughs> the book does more, and it is more made uh, and I, than I had expected. And, and I don't think there are you know, many, many more compliments you could possibly pay to a, <laughs> to the book as a piece of literature, um, as, a, as a piece of theology or spirituality. Perhaps there are other things you might want to say about it. So those are my views. It's been tremendous fun doing this. And thank you so much for listening. Um, I've really appreciated your comments and, and uh, just seeing the, the number of views and things has, has sort of kept me going and, and kept me reaching for the next chapter. This has been great fun. Uh, and I hope, if nothing else, it persuades you to go and read Lewis again, or possibly to read some of the things that Lewis read. This was always his great wish, that people would read his work and then go and read Athanasius or go and read William Dunbar or Julian of Norwich or or, uh, or something like that. So perhaps that's what you'll do. Either way, I hope you have a good fun time reading.